I want to share something with you I read this week uh, on Truth and Forum. The actor Keanu, uh, Keanu Reeves uh, was on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert recently. At one point, Colbert asked his guest, what do you think happens when we die? Uh, he said to Keanu, Re Keanu Reeves, both men are no stranger to tragedy for Colbert lost his father and two of his brothers to a plane crash when he was only 10 years old. Reeves and his girlfriend, Jennifer Simey, lost their daughter a month before she was due. Uh, Simey later died in a car accident. Reeves paused. He considered, then replied simply, I know that the ones who love us will miss us. After Reeves answered Colbert's question, the host paused, looked into the camera, and smiled. If a man dies, shall he live again, Joe Bask? A 24-year-old Norwegian woman rescued a puppy she found while vacationing in the Philippines. She brought the puppy back to her resort where she washed it and played with it. Her family later told reporters that she received small scraps from the dog. When she returned home, she fell ill. She was admitted to a hospital on April the 28th where physicians determined she had contracted rabies from the dog and she died on May the 6th. In other news, two sightseeing planes collided Monday afternoon off the coast of Alaska. Six people were killed and a traveling carnival worker has confessed to killing two women and a teenager within an 18-day period in Virginia. Humans face no more relevant question than the one that Job asked so long ago. If a man dies, shall he live again? As John F. Kennedy noted, we are all mortal. Given the reality of death, I'm amazed by the degree to which people are willing to bet their eternity on their personal opinion. Imagine Stephen Colbert asking Keanu Reeves, what do you think happens when you contract cancer? Would Reeves respond to a malignancy based on his subjective beliefs or on an oncologist's professional experience? Our opinions don't change reality. The Queen of England exists whether I believe she exists or not. Heaven and hell are real whether I believe they are real or not. Isaiah warned his day and ours. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Wise King Solomon cautioned us, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn from evil. Paul, the brilliant apostle, agreed, never be wise in your own sight. Nonetheless, when it comes to our eternal destiny, our secular culture is convinced that opinion is fact. The question, has Satan fostered a more dangerous and popular deception today? I read that because of what I want to preach on this morning. This morning is our final sermon in the series of Why Study Bible Prophecy. What is the relevancy to Bible prophecy in the 21st century to you and to me? And so for the past 11 weeks, we have looked at this topic from God's Word. And this morning, I want to speak about the truth, the truth from God's Word about eternity. You see, there are lots of false teachings today. In fact, someone said there's some 2,500 false religions and there are some 1,800 cults all over America. And you see, there are lots of people that believe there's a heaven, but they don't believe there's a hell. I've never understood that. Why would you need heaven if there's no hell? And uh, there are a lot of people out there that are teaching a idea about what they think eternity is all about, when the Bible very plainly lets us know there are two destinations out there to which every person 
who has ever breathed the breath of life is headed to. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 13 and 14, Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Jesus very plainly said there are two gates, there are two roads, and there are two destinies. Now up to this point in our studies on Why Study Bible Prophecy, we tracked the future of believers as well as the future of non-believers in God's prophetic plan. We've seen that when a Christian dies, their spirit goes immediately to God who gave it. And the body will be resurrected at a specific time according to God's order. Jesus being the first fruits of the resurrection. Some will be resurrected at the rapture. Others will be resurrected at the second coming. And still others will uh, be resurrected at the end of the millennium. Not only will Christians uh, be resurrected, but Christians will be rewarded again at different times, and we looked at that last week. Believers living in this present time, since Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. We have been living in these days for the past 2,000 years. It's what we would call the age of grace, when God came, died on the cross, and gave to us his wonderful gift of grace. Uh, during this time, the age of grace, or we would call it the church age at this particular time, Christians will someday be raptured out of here. We will uh, be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. Other believers will be rewarded at times that are not specified in the Scripture, but all believers will share the same future one of these days. Resurrected bodies, eternal rewards, and a recreated heaven and earth. Sadly, unbelievers will not share in that future. Although some unbelievers, those who survived the tribulation, will be judged when Jesus comes in the second coming and will cast into the lake of fire the majority of unbelievers, and their judgment will be based upon their works because their works cannot exceed the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. They refused him in this life. Therefore, they will be judged by their works and cast into the eternal lake of fire where according to Revelation chapter 20 verse 10 says, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Just like the beast, that's the Antichrist young people, the false prophet, that will be the one who leads up the one world religion someday. It'll be a false religion. And also Satan who is called the dragon in the book of Revelation. But what we're going to look at this morning is this. What is hell going to be like for unbelievers? And secondly, what can believers anticipate about heaven one of these days? First of all, let me give you the truth about hell this morning. I think it's very interesting that many people who accept the idea of heaven they just as easily dismiss the biblical teaching about a literal hell. Robert Ingersoll, he was a famous lawyer. He was an atheist in the 19th century. He once delivered a lecture. It was a very scorching lecture on the absurdity of hell. He labeled hell as the scarecrow of religion. And he told his audience how unscientific the whole concept was. Most intelligent people, Ingersoll claimed, had long ago abandoned belief in hell. A drunk approached Ingersoll after his talk and said, Bob, I liked your lecture about hell, but I want you to be sure about it because I'm depending on you. Well, let me tell you, instead of listening to the Robert Ingersolls of this world that are atheists, let me tell you, we better turn to the one and the only one 
who could tell us the truth about our eternal destiny. Jesus had a great deal to say about the reality of hell. In fact, Jesus spoke more on hell than he ever did about heaven. And the most extensive discourse that Jesus gives us about this place called hell is found in the book of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19, to 7, 19 through 26. Please follow along with me. Now there was a rich man, Jesus is speaking here, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at this gate, at his gate covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were fallen from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried, get this, was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. You wonder how you're going to get to heaven one of these days? Paula Stafford and me were talking about it this week. Her precious father, 101 years old, Reford, passed away. He went to be with Jesus. And Paula shared with me how she shared with her father Dad, when it's time to go, the angels are going to usher you into the presence of Jesus. That's what the Bible says right here. The Bible says, now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Young people, that's speaking about paradise. And the rich man also died, and notice nobody came to carry him. The Bible says the rich man died and was buried. In Hades, what is Hades? That's the realm of the dead. That was the place for the dead. In Hades, in the Old Testament, Hades had two compartments. One of them was called paradise, and the other was for those that were lost. And uh, when Jesus died on the cross, and during those three days, most Bible scholars believe Jesus went into Hades and released those that were saved, that were captive there, and took them to paradise or into heaven. In Hades, notice what happened. Uh, the rich man lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And look what the rich man did. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he's being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. Let me tell you, in the New Testament, there are three words that describe the destination of non-Christians. And while all three of these words are translated as the word hell, H-E-L-L, -L, in many English versions of the Bible, the three Greek words refer to very different places. For example, in 2 Peter 2 and 4, the only place it's used in the New Testament is the word Tartarus, T-A-R. T-A-R-O-S, Tartarus. It's a Greek word there. And it describes the place of judgment of those wicked angels that Jesus sent there in Jude, verse 6. And then there's another Greek word for hell, and it is the word Gehenna. It's used 12 times in the New Testament, and it primarily refers to the lake of fire that will be the final residence of all the unsaved. In fact, you can find that over in Revelation 19, verse 20, in Revelation 20, verse 10, in Revelation 20, verse 15. And then the third word for hell in the New Testament is Hades, H-A-D-E-S. That's 
the word that's used here in the parable that Jesus is giving us. It's the third word used for hell, and it describes a temporary location of the unsaved dead who are waiting to stand before the great white throne judgment someday to be judged according to their works, which will condemn them to separation and a literal burning hell for all eternity. Although Jesus is specifically describing Hades in our parable, you and I can assume that the horrors of Hades are also characteristics of the eternal lake of fire. What did Jesus say about hell? Number one, he said hell is a place of physical torment. Jesus warned that this is a place of indescribable suffering. There'll be no relief from pain and agony and suffering in hell. There'll be unending weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, according to Luke chapter 13, verse 28. Hell is a place of physical torment. Secondly, hell is a place of indescribable loneliness. One of the greatest things that the World Health Organization is concerned about in our day is loneliness. Loneliness. It has become one of the greatest maladies in the 21st century. It's right up there with cancer and heart attacks. Lonely people out there living their lives in loneliness. And let me tell you, the Bible says that hell is a place of darkness. Matthew 8, verse 12, there will be no socializing in hell. Let me tell you, young people, you hear a lot of these songs on the radio, and they talk about all the beer drinking that's going to go on and the parties that's going to go on in hell. No, no, let me tell you, it won't be a party. It'll be everything but a party. The Bible says it's eternal darkness. There will be no socializing in hell because no one will be able to see anyone. They'll just hear weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let me tell you, hell is a place of physical torment. Secondly, hell is a place of indescribable loneliness. And thirdly, hell is a place of no return. There are those out there who teach that hell is only temporary. They say that one of these days, that, that those that go there, it'll just be a time of pruning away. It'll be a time that they can come to a place of correction. And then they will no longer be in that place. Well, let me tell you, that's not what Jesus said. In fact, in the story we just read, Jesus said the rich man begged for Abraham to cross over into that place of torment and to relieve him of the torment. Or at least would he send somebody to warn his siblings of the horrors of that place, but Abraham reminded him that between us and you, there's a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. Let me tell you, once we die, our eternal destination will be our final destination. There are no second chances after you die. Fairness doesn't demand God give people a second chance after death since he gives us thousands of chances before we die. Somebody put that so ably. Martin Marty, renowned professor at the University of Chicago, said about the reality of hell, he said this, if people really believed in hell, They wouldn't be watching basketball games or even the television preachers, but they'd be out there trying to rescue souls. I want you to think about that this morning. He said, if people really believed in hell, they wouldn't be watching basketball games or even the television preachers, but they'd be out there rescuing the lost, rescuing the perishing. Well, Jesus said hell is a real place. 
let me give you something else that's far better than that destination. It's the truth about heaven. Let me give you some questions that are often asked about heaven. Number one, is heaven really a place or is heaven just a state of mind? Well, the Bible goes to great lengths to demonstrate that heaven is a definite, literal place. In John 14, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also. Let me tell you, when Jesus made his ascension back to heaven, Acts chapter 1 verse 9 through 11 says, and after he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you've watched him go into heaven. Let me tell you, is heaven a literal place? Absolutely. Second question people ask about heaven, where do Christians go when they die? Paul said to the church at Corinth, at home with the Lord. When unbelievers die, somebody that doesn't know Jesus, where do they go? They immediately began to suffer in agony. But when a Christian dies, we are immediately transported into God's presence. Here's a third question people ask about heaven. What's the difference between the millennial kingdom, remember that, the thousand-year period of peace after Jesus comes back? the thousand-year reign? What's the difference between that thousand-year reign of the millennial kingdom and the new heaven and the new earth described in Revelation 21, 22? Well, the millennial kingdom will involve a renovation of the present earth, but after the great white throne judgment where the lost are consigned to hell, the Bible says the present heaven and earth will be completely destroyed, 2 Peter 3, 7. And God will unveil his new heaven and his new earth. Look at Revelation 21, verse 1 and 2. John said, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. When God recreates the new heaven and the new earth, then the holy city will come down and rest upon this earth. The final destinations the final destination for you and for me as Christians. Where will it be? It'll be in that new Jerusalem that John saw coming down. Now the size of this new Jerusalem, that city that John says is coming down, the Bible tells us that it is 1,500 miles long, it's 1,500 miles wide, and it's 1,500 miles high according to Revelation 21, 16. And because of those measurements, I believe that that begs for a literal interpretation of this city that Jesus talked about. Dr. W.A. Criswell, who pastored Dallas First Baptist Church for 50 years, he said, given those dimensions, those measurements of heaven, it would stretch from Maine to Florida and it would cover all of Ireland, Great Britain, France, Spain, Germany, Austria, Italy, Turkey, and half of Russia. So don't worry about if that is going to be big enough. Folks, let me tell you, there's also no reason to think that Christians will be confined to this earthly city. Since we're going to have supernatural bodies, we'll be free to roam the universe. And when I mentioned a few weeks ago of the hundreds and billions that are galaxies that are out there, 
in the universe. You and I could not even begin to plumb the depths. And when we've been there 10,000 years, it will only be a teardrop in the oceans of this world of what heaven is going to be like. So don't worry about it. You're not going to be floating around on a pink cloud plucking a ukulele. That's not what heaven's going to be about. Here's another question people ask about heaven. What kind of bodies will we have in heaven? Well, we know this. Our bodies will be both superior and at the same time similar to this present body. Luke 24 tells us that Jesus' body after the resurrection wasn't limited by time and space. He could travel through walls. He could walk through doors. He had flesh. He had bones. The disciples could touch him. Jesus ate with them in his new body. He apparently retained some of the physical characteristics of this earthly body since those disciples recognized him. And that's why I believe you and I can safely assume that you and I too will recognize each other when we get to heaven. Now you're going to go, oh, well, there's just some people I don't want to recognize. <laughs> Preacher, there's just some people I didn't like down there, and I don't want to see them in heaven. Well, you're going to be in a different body. Hello? You're not going to be in the sinful body that you had down here. So the ones you didn't like down here, you're going to like up there, amen? Or down here, this will be the final destination for us. Well, let me tell you, whenever they build planes, they're fixing to build a, a supersonic jet plane. I read about it this week. It's already in the making. It'll be five years before they complete all of the stuff and 10 years before it's in flight operation. It'll be able to fly from New York to London in 90 minutes. I might get on that one. I just don't want to be over the ocean eight hours. 90 minutes. It'll fly from New York to London. No wonder the Bible says in the last days, knowledge will increase and abound. Let me tell you, what kind of body will we have in heaven? Well, I'll tell you what, whoever wanted to go to a family reunion and, and not know anybody there. Folks, let me tell you, heaven's going to be far beyond any expectation. I've often wondered, Jesus, why didn't you tell us more about heaven than the scant passages that we have? And it just dawned on me, well, number one, because in our finiteness, you and I would never be able to comprehend the infinite God and all that he's prepared for you and for me in the days to come. Question number five, often asked about heaven, what age are we going to be in heaven? I've been asked that a jillion times. Well, there are some who have theorized that we're going to be the same age that Jesus was when he began his earthly ministry that would be around 30 years old. Oh, some of you, those wrinkles, no more. No more Botox. No more makeup. Boy, just think about all the money you can save. Well, the truth is this. The Bible is silent. The Bible is silent on that issue. Some things he has revealed, Deuteronomy 29, 29. Some things he has revealed, some things he hasn't revealed to us. Question number six, another question about heaven. Will there be animals in heaven? We live in a world, let me tell you, I'd love to be somebody's pet. I, I, I'm up for adoption. I, I, let me tell you, some of these pets have better lives than some of us humans have. So if anybody's looking for a pet, I can get on all fours and bark. I can wave. Let me tell you, will there be animals in heaven? Well, at the second coming, Jesus described when he, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 5, when Jesus comes back, he's coming back on a white horse. That's what the book of Revelation says, Revelation 19, 11. The Bible also says those of us that are coming back with him, that we're going to come back on white horses. I used to tell Thelma Toddy, many of you know Thelma, Thelma Toddy, bless her heart, she's in heaven today. I always said, Thelma, I want to be, I want to come back. I, I want my horse to be right beside yours because I'm going to flank yours on the way down. Well, during the thousand-year reign on the earth, during the millennium, the Bible describes that there will be the presence of animals on the, on the renovated earth. It speaks about a child, remember, 
talking about the wolf, the lamb, the calf, and the lion. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6 through 9. However, there is no specific mention of animals in the new heaven and the new earth once the present heaven and the earth are destroyed, but I think we'll just have to wait and see. As Dr. W.A. Criswell would say, that's just another of God's little imponderables. There's a lot of things out there that you and I will just have to wait and see. I cannot imagine that there wouldn't be. I, uh, I'm just going to believe in my heart that there will be. I don't know why there wouldn't be if we're coming back on horses. If uh, the millennial kingdom's going to have them, I'm sure if he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth, it's going to have everything that we'll ever need. Seventh question people ask, will there be marriage in heaven? Well, I'm going to get to be just like you then. Jesus answered this question. There are a bunch of Sadducees that came to Jesus. You see, they didn't believe in an afterlife. Now, the Pharisees believed in an afterlife. But the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection and afterlife. So, they got Jesus together and they wanted to try to make a mockery of him. And one of them said to Jesus, well, if a woman has seven different husbands in this life, whose wife will she be in heaven? This is how Jesus answered that question in Luke 20, verse 34 to 36. The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot even die anymore because they are like angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. Now, Jesus didn't say when you die, you become an angel. Hello? Hello? I heard that on television the other night. A lady was telling about her spouse dying. She said, well, God needed another angel. No, he didn't. No, he didn't need another angel. He created all he created one time, and they, they're forever created. When you die, we don't become angels. But the Bible says we don't marry and are given in marriage. Remember, we're going to be in a spiritual body, a resurrected body. It'll have a whole different mindset. An eighth question people ask, and I'm almost finished, what will we do in heaven? Well, we're going to worship, but let me tell you, we're going to also work. Those of you who said, oh, I thought when I get to heaven, I wasn't going to have to work anymore. Well, it's not mutually, mutually exclusive activities because in the new heaven and the new earth, we're going to be busy performing the task that God gives us for our faithfulness upon this earth. According to the parable of the talents in the Bible that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 25, it indicates that we're going to be assigned responsibilities for ruling over cities, planets, and galaxies. So you better get faithful if you want to do some ruling one of these days. Question number nine and last question. Are Christians in heaven aware of what's going on down here. Are Christians in heaven aware of what's happening on the earth? Many people look at the passage, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, as evidence for that. It says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. However, if you read that in context, to what it means, it's demonstrating that those cloud of witnesses is referring to the heroes in the faith in Hebrews chapter 11. But there are some indications that people in heaven have an understanding of what's happening on earth. For example, in Luke 16, Abraham was aware of the rich man suffering in Hades. The tribulation saints will be aware of God's temporary restraint of judgment against those that are creating evil on the earth. 
Paul indicated that our perspective in this life is limited, but he said in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, one day we will know fully as we are known. I would assume that such perfect knowledge would include a full awareness of all that is happening on earth. I would assume that to be with Jesus, that would be perfect knowledge. I would assume that that would include an awareness of what's happening on the earth. Well, we'll just have to see about those things. But I do believe that there is an awareness of what is going on down here. They would look at it differently than we look at it. They would see things in a different fashion than you and I would see things. I want to leave you with these two thoughts as we leave this series of studies. I'll begin a new series of studies next week for 11 weeks on the successful secrets from Solomon. I want to leave you with these two thoughts. I hope that the reality of the great white throne judgment where all the lost of the ages will stand and they will be consigned to their eternal destiny of torment, darkness, separation, suffering, weeping, and gnashing of teeth. I would hope that the reality of that will motivate you and motivate me to share the gospel with more people than we ever have. And secondly, shouldn't the certainty of each one of us as Christians standing before Jesus someday at the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of what we did from the moment we got saved until the moment we meet Jesus I would hope that that certainty would impact how we invest our time and how we invest our energy for the days that we have in this life. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed these past 11 weeks of Why Study Bible Prophecy. Would you stand as we pray together? Father, we thank you once again for today.